and away we go. So welcome to the first of the 2020-21 uh, ENSO seminar series. We are delighted that Humina Clavel um, will be um, presenting to us um, this um, uh, well, today in just a few minutes. <laughs> just before we get started, um, I'm sort of sh shifting around between windows here, so um, I please bear with me. Um, before we get started, we have a, a piece of news for the community, um, which is regarding a, an upcoming event just in the, the next couple of weeks. It was a, a, a live conference which was due to take place, which has now been shifted to next year, but in, in place of the live conference, um, Johanna Rochacek, Leonardi's uh, group are running a virtual teaser symposium, um, which will take place on the 18th and 19th of September. Um, it's still 2020, so um, it'll probably remain that way for some time, unfortunately, but um, there we have it. The, uh, the lineup of speakers is um, uh, one to very much look forward to. Hani Viacher, Mark Baker, Vasuredi, Li Wei, Bert Hodges, um, Sarah Brotasmundi, Michael Richardson, and John Sutton, Rachel Callan, and Sarah Kim Jortborg. It's um, free registration until the 13th of September, I think, so... Um, something to stick in the diary and well worth um, our time, I think. So um, definitely uh, one of interest for this community. Um, so that um, piece of business out of the way, as it were, um, we can move to the, the proper order of the day, which is our speaker who um, just finishing up in the um, you know, University of St. Andrews and now moved uh, as of this week, as I understand, to the University Excellent. of Tartu in, in uh, Estonia. So um, Thank thanks very much for, for joining us. No, thank um, you so much. Great. Um, so, yeah, I guess the um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the talk. And I will um, invite you to, to start the presentation. Then we can talk about perceiving like a girl. Excellent. OK, so let me. Uh start by sharing my screen. Um, oh, sorry, Mary, could you enable me to share the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, is that working? Excellent. I'm just checking yeah. if I've got a settings wrong. I think everything um, should be set up. Now it is. Sorry about that. Here it is. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, yeah, so thank you so much for having me here today. I'm very excited. And yeah, well, today I'm presenting this talk, Seeming Like a Girl. It is a talk on the situated character of perceptual experience. And my aim is to show that we can do justice to this aspect of perception by claiming that perception is social all the way down. This, it will become a bit clear what I mean by this in a moment. Uh, but my ar argument will be that a predictive version of sensory motor inactivism can provide a plausible story to account for this aspect of perceptual experience. Okay, so let's start here. Now, what, what do I mean when I say that perceptual experience is situated? Well, according to some approaches within the phenomenological tradition, um, we are situated agents. And the idea roughly is that we are never just embedded in a given context. Instead, the social, historical, political, economic, and personal circumstances we inhabit are marked in our body. One consequence of this view is that our social circumstances shape our mental lives. And this consequence is already noted, for instance, by De Beauvoir in her review of the phenomenology of perception, where she claims that, and I quote, all perceptual perception in general presupposes an indefinite past lying behind oneself, a communication with a world that is older than thought, quoting here uh, Merle Ponty, which is made concrete by the fact of my birth. My history is incarnated in a body that possesses a certain generality a relationship with the world, which is prior to myself. Okay, 
So if the Bobois analysis is on the right track, our situation should be in consequence reflected in the way we carry ourselves, in the way we relate to others, in the way we think, and of course, crucial for my purposes, in the way we perceive the world. So that's the idea I am interested in. My plan for the rest of the talk will be to uh, firstly articulate Aris Marion Young's view of feminine comportment. I will then turn to Injap Jacobson's articulation of the question about the influence of society on perception. In the third part of the talk, I introduce a couple of examples that show that Jacobson's account does not cover all the interesting ways in which perception is social. And in the final section, I introduce the predictive approach to sensory modern act and activism, sorry, and explain how we can do justice to the situated character of perceptual experiences. So now to Jung. So Jung's view can come in handy to articulate the situated character of perceptual experience since she discusses how gender identity shapes the way, for instance, women carry themselves in the world and execute certain tasks and activities. Jung's point of departure is her analysis of Erwin Strauss's observations of the way women and men throw a ball. So what caught Strauss's attention is the difference between men and women in the performance of this task. He notices that there is a clear difference in the comportment of someone, depending on their gender identity, both towards the world, towards objects in the world, and towards space. Now, while Jung dismisses Strauss's account, she remains interested in this difference in comportment. Unlike Strauss, Jung aims to show how this difference is due to a difference in situation. So drawing on de Beauvoir and, of, and on other phenomenological approaches as well, she argues that there is a unity that grounds this typical feminine comportment. This, this is a unity of situation, a situation that is, of course, common to a group of people living in a specific time and given uh, a specific context. She defines an individual situation in terms of the circumstances that shapes their existence. So according to Jung, it is possible to identify the situation as a modality of existence, that is, as a way of being in the world, as a set of structures that constrains the, the way a group of individuals orient their bodies in the world. And as mentioned, she's interested in the modality that is typical for individuals who identify as women. However, we should be able to extend this analysis to other genders as well and to all the other social identities. So for instance, Jung examines movements that are typically observed in women and finds certain features common to them. One example of this is for her, the way women restrict certain movements, how they, they position, for instance, their feet for, for certain tasks. And to contrast the way women position their bodies and the way men position their bodies, Jung claims that given differences in situation, men in some patriarchal societies, and I quote, summon the full possibilities of their muscular coordination, possession, voice, and bearing. Women, in contrast, would not summon these possibilities. These possibilities are, of course, available to them in virtue of, physical, of certain physical uh, features. Right, of the physical structure of their body, their strength, their shape, and yet these do not appear as possibilities. So that's what caught Jung's attention. Now for her analysis, Jung's point of departure is Merleau-Ponty's articulation of the body as the locus of subjectivity and intentionality, analyzed in terms of the different capacities the body exhibits. The key idea is that in providing possibilities of action, for instance, grasping an apple or turning to see the window or you know, walking towards the door, the body, the body opens the world to a subject. Some existential features of the feminine life body have consequences for the way it's paid this experience. The body opens a world of possibilities, and that means that the phenomenal space becomes apparent in relation to the body's possibilities of movement and action. Now, if this is so, the phenomenal space experienced by women would be different. Women relate to space in a way that is ultimately reflected in the way they do things, and this in turn originates um, from their relation to their bodies. Moreover, since motility is crucial for the development 
of other cognitive and perceptual capacities, Jung predicts that these existential categories impact women's performance in related cognitive and perceptual tasks. Now, Jung holds the view that someone's situation shapes their mental lives and interactions with the world. And although she doesn't articulate as such a view about the situatedness of perceptual experience as such, I dare to say that she would accept its possibility. However, these considerations only take us so far in what concerns this claim. Because after all, from the fact that our situation has an impact on how we move, it doesn't follow immediately that it has an, an impact on how we move to sensory investigate the world. Now, I mention this because we might be particularly wary of making the claim that perception is situated when thinking about the position enjoyed by perception as a source of knowledge. The idea that our circumstances have an influence in or let alone shape perception hinders perception's role as a source of knowledge. I mention this because this is the point of departure taken by Inja Jacobson, who is also interested in analyzing the social influence um, of per in perception. Now, Jacobson aims at addressing the question about the social aspect of perceptual experience. She notes that while perceptual experience is typically taken to be a reliable guide for, and I quote her, for the discovery of truths, it is also the case that knowledge is affected in many ways by our, by our social historical circumstances. Now, Jacobson's view is that only at later stages of visual processing, uh, for her, these are stages related to, for instance, well, the classification of objects, only then does perceptual processing rely on conceptual learning. And for her, it is only at this point that perceptual experience can be said to receive social influence. This is so because based on previous learning, we fill in the gaps left by sensory input and we draw for that on our socially learned concepts. So Jacobson's thesis is that perception is not social in itself, but in virtue of the interactions between perception and higher order cognition. If perceptual experience is social, according to her, this is incidental on visual processing, relying on this other higher order cognitive process. Okay, let me say something before going to those examples. Because, okay, now Jacobson might be right in claiming that so that some social influence on perception is due to its interactions with other pro cognitive processes. However, I think that by relying on a different frameworks and an, on other, another set of assumptions, we can show that perception's uh, social aspect is far more pervasive. So that's where I wanna go. Now, I will specifically turn to a predictive version of sensor motor and activism to provide a plausible story for this. However, before doing so, and to learn, lend further plausibility to the thought that social influence is not reduced to conceptual influence, I will turn to a couple of examples first. Uh, the first is this case, which is uh, the case of social referencing. Now, social referencing is a regulation of one's behavior on the basis of others' emotional reactions to a particular situation. I'm following here Bermuda's um, description of the phenomenon. In children's development, this is manifested when uh, children face, for instance, a puzzling, unfamiliar, or intimidating situation. Children tend to look back at their carer, looking for guidance when facing these situations. So according to Bermudez, the children's behavior is influenced by the emotional response of the carer to the situation. Here, Bermudez refers to an experiment by Kleinert and colleagues, in which children were tested on the avoidance of a modified visual clue. So this test uses a modified platform with a clear glass, uh, glass plate that has two sides, a shallow side and a deep side. Now below the shallow side, there is a checker pattern that is immediately below the surface. And on the other side, there is the same pattern, but placed at a certain distance to make it appear as a cliff. Now, Cleaner and colleagues observed that 12-month-old children look for feedback from their carrier after looking at the deep side of the, of the platform. 
And while of the children whose care is mild and was okay with it, most of them crossed to the deep side. None of the children whose care shows fear uh, crossed to, to that same side, right? So what this shows is that we learn how to interpret sensory information based on feedback from others. The cliff, for instance, becomes something that children should avoid or something that is, I don't know, worrisome in light of their carrier's reaction. Okay, let me now turn to the second example. Consider differences across individuals from different cultural, uh, cultural groups, given their susceptibility to the miller lighter illusion, the well-known illusion that involves two or three arrows, arrows of the same length that differ in their direction to which their points end. No, to which their ends point. Sorry about that. So in an extensive study by Siegel and colleagues, the authors show that there are substantial differences in the susceptibility to the illusion depending on the cultural environment in which an individual spent their first 20 years of life. For this, the authors analyzed 17 small scale societies. According to uh, Macaulay and Henry, who have written on the subject, the difference has been attributed to the adaptation of the visual system to the local environment. Now, depending on the environment, the visual system, and here I'm quoting Macaulay and Henry, the, the visual system builds up biases that tend to produce use, useful inferences for the environment. So Siegel and colleagues' that hypothesis is that the cause of these variations is individuals' exposure to carpet and environments. That is, environments that are populated by buildings, rooms, furniture, things that have sharp, ang uh, sharp right angles, and the thing is that these angles are interpreted by the visual system as an indication of depth, leading thus to the illusion. Now, I'm interested in these examples because according to them, uh, it seems that perception is influenced by society in at least two more ways, in addition to the conceptual influence identified by Jacobson, right? So firstly, social interactions are relevant to the development of perceptual capacities, and secondly, social and cultural circumstances have an effect in our susceptibility to perceptual illusions. That is, depending on our social context, we might be better or worse adapted to process certain visual information and to do so in a certain way. So this example suggests that perceptual experience is not just incidentally social, but social all the way down, right? And this brings us closer to the idea that perceptual experience is situated. So let me turn to the fourth part of the talk. I will very briefly outline the views on which I am relying for the proposal, which are sensory modern and activism and the free energy approach. And I'll start off with sensory modern and activism. Okay, so the central idea of sensory modern and activism is that perceivers are necessarily skillful agents. Perception is itself an interaction with the environment that requires the possession and exercise of a certain kind of practical knowledge that is that uh, of the way sensor information changes after an interaction. The richness and detail of perceptual experience is explained by one's possession of that knowledge. Now, Sensor modern activism, at least to some extent, has the tools to account for important aspects of perceptual experience that depend on movement, of course. And it might also be adequate to account for at least some of the things Young is interested in, right? So recall that her claim is that we experience a space differently given our gender identity. So this surely has an impact on the practical knowledge that would be required to percep for perceptual experience according to sensory modern activism, because it must have an impact on our perceptual skills. Now, one slight problem with sensory modern activism in that respect is that the understanding of embodiment that, is, uh, that pertains to this approach is too limited, since it refers mostly to morphological aspects. So for instance, it refers to the shape of our body, to the position of our limbs. And the, the thing is that embodiment is far richer than that. And that is the point of the Vaux claim that I presented at the beginning. Now, 
Given other limitations within the sense of modern activism, which of course I do not discuss here, it has been proposed to marry sense of modern activism with predictive processing. So let me now turn to this other. Okay. So predictive processing is a functional approach to neural dynamics, at least typically it is interpreted in that way, that takes the brain to be driven down by top-down processing. Very roughly, very, very roughly. According to the, this view, perceptual processing is described as a cascade of predictions that is met and adjusted, met by and adjusted on the basis of incoming stimuli. So an example that can be useful to illustrate the position advanced that by the framework relates to visual tracking. So think, for instance, of the capacity to follow a visual cue, perhaps like a bird in the sky. So according to predictive processing, this capacity can be explained by taking the brain to predict the position of the bird as it moves. So in this case, the prediction, for instance, the position of the bird is inferred on the basis of the brain's best model of the world. The advanced prediction is met at a lower level by incoming stimuli. This prediction is there then compared against this input, providing error feedback on the prediction. And in addition to processing error feedback, the brain also processes the reliability and salience of this feedback, which is called precision. So what this means is that error feedback is given more or less weight depending on its reliability. Okay, so that's predictive processing. But there is another view, the vicinity of predictive processing, that is, strictly speaking, a theory about the adaptive behavior of biological systems. And this is a free energy approach. From this perspective, predictive processing, which is what I just described, is one way to implement this theory of biological systems. Now, I do not get into too much detail here, but what is relevant about the free energy approach is the way they see the model from which predictions are generated. According to the free energy approach, the biological system is an embodied agent whose boundaries are defined in virtue of its interactions with the environment. Moreover, it is a whole agent that constitutes the model from which the system anticipates its interactions. And this is both at the neural and at the bodily level. So how does this all come together? Well, the idea is that the practical knowledge that is required for perceptual experience is supported by the process described by the free energy approach. From this perspective, perception is supported by the coding of sensory motor knowledge by, at both neural and body levels. And in that sense, perception would be an instance of an embodied and inactive process. Now, embodied and inactive in a very particular sense. On the one hand, it is embodied in that the brain and the body recapitulate the environment, and it is inactive in that it enacts or brings forth its own rules and parameters of constitution and viability. Now, neural and bodily structures recapitulate the history of interactions of the system. This idea that uh, somehow perceptual processing is already uh, influenced by, by our cultural practices is of course not new within this framework, right? Some authors have defended that this we can already make a case for the relevance of culture uh, to, uh, for perceptual processing. So for instance, for Kurt Hoff and Kieberstein, the generative model tracks our engagement in social and cultural practices. For them, and I quote, it is our ability to maintain attunement with the regularities in a cultural practice that can, depending on the context, exert a powerful influence on the perceptual processing of a sensory signal. The authors add that our attunement is not only to a content, but, and I quote again, to expectations between people. So the idea is that we share a common world with those with whom we engage in cultural social practices, and consequence, consequently, we likely share a model of the world, that is, we likely embodied, embody at least a partially shared model of the world. Now, one aspect that is crucial, uh, yeah, okay, sorry, one aspect that is crucial uh, for this analysis is that this attunement will depend not only on the context of the individual and the task um, that is at play, 
right? It is not only that that is relevant, it will also depend on an important way on who that individual is and on certain features of their situation. Now, the reason for this is that the context to which we have to adapt is not the same for everybody, nor are the expectations from others. So the idea that our social identity makes a difference in the way we participate in these social practices. And this is precisely the point of Jung's analysis. So even when we are engaged in the same practice, within the same context, the gender identity of an individual in this case, for instance, plays a role in determining the space of possibilities and expectations. So for example, when throwing a ball, the proprioceptive prediction of someone who identifies as a woman in a certain con context will be different from that of someone who identifies as a woman in another context. And more importantly, it will be different as well uh, to, the, to someone who identifies as a man. Now, our patterns of sensory motor interactions will vary due to features of our situation. Now, Jung indicates that this might explain the difference in performance in tasks related to spatial uh, perception. So accordingly, given our gender identity and other aspects of socialization, we might sample sensory information differently. So, this is still uh, speculative, but, and of course, much more is needed to argue that differences in our situation in this way make a difference to perceptual processes. However, I hope I have shown that it is at least plausible within this framework to think that they do and do justice in this way to the idea that perception is situated all the way down. Okay, so thank you. And just, uh, here's a list of references. No one needs them. That's excellent. So thank thank you very much, um, Jimena. So um, we have a, a few uh, a few voices other than mine um, present today, which I'm always pleased about um, and I always prefer to let speak. So um, uh, Giada, Fred and Mason, if um, you can unmute yourselves and, and either just wave or, or use the, the hands up thing to let us know if you'd like to speak. Uh, okay, Mason, so, go, um, go, ahead, go ahead, Mason. Um, so I'm kind of curious about the very social aspects of perception in general. So the sort of gendered and social just seems extra interesting. Um, so I was kind of, you suddenly, you started getting to the really interesting part and then stopped just as you started talking about the sort of, the individual sort of sampling sensory information differently based on gender or based on i mean i'm thinking based on my personal skill development um the kind of practices i'm used to participating in um i was reading a paper a few years ago on sort of gen uh, no it was before the pandemic so it feels like a few years ago um earlier this year on gendered uh affordances i was trying to sort of figure out whether there are gendered affordances and while I was sort of thinking about this, I was reading an interview with a woman who basically described her relationship, her different perception to her brother. Her brother says, I love running in the park. It gets me away from all the trees. She says, I hate running in the park. I stay running on the road. It gets me away from all scary guys. Um, so her, his perception of the park is a free space where he can be away from all the sort of danger of the cars and so on. Her perception of the park is a dangerous place where creepy guys hide behind trees and she'd rather stay in a public place where she's safer. Um, so it's those kinds of what you pay attention to, what matters that you've developed through this sort of lifetime of skill development. Um, so I'm thinking of these sort of, I mean, especially social aspects of our perceptual space and the, the way in which we engage that. And it sounded like you were sort of getting towards that, but, and it's, it's that in particular that I find kind of well, just most interesting. So anything you want to say about the sort of especially social practice dimensions of our personal experience and how that shapes perception. Thank you, Mason, so much. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think that's the most interesting uh, aspect. Uh, and my problem at this moment has been gathering more and more information, for instance, related specifically. So for instance, um, there's a lot on whether there are uh, difference in, in some aspects of perception, for, so for instance, related to depth perception, 
or uh, susceptibility of emotions depending on sex differences. Okay. And so studies doesn't do not throw that much, you know, nothing too interesting. That would be an interesting difference. I am interesting in the social aspect. Not on the sex differences, but on the gender differences and other aspects of our social identity that would give us information about what he said, for instance, how um, a path might appear as fear, fearsome uh, or perhaps as dangerous, right, for someone given certain aspects, not only in this case, for instance, of gender identity, but even uh, where were you socialized, right? So if, if you come from, from a society, with very high rates of crime against women, let's just say something like that, you might find that situation even more fearful, right? Uh, so those are, I completely agree with you. I also uh, think that it has a lot to do with our perceptual skills and the way we develop them. So I'm starting to you know, dig into that to see which would be the relevant differences and how, of course, intuitively, I or not even intuitively, phenomenologically, know about the differences. So I'm starting to dig into that. Can I ask you about the paper you were mentioning? You're muted, please. Sorry, I, I'm, I was actually reviewing a draft for a journal, so I shouldn't say too much about it, but it got me intrigued about the whole topic. Okay, okay. okay. I'm gonna remain attentive to Yes, yeah, so I, I don't know who wrote it either. <laughs> okay, Fred, you seem to want to come in there. Yeah, thank you very much. There was an awful lot in that, and that would, there, there's quite a number of stages in, in, in the argument you laid out. And, and it seems to me that your starting point with that wonderful quote from de Beauvoir that my history is incarnated in a body that possesses a relationship with the world prior to myself, that is seems to me it, it was a, an excellent starting point because that theme can be elaborated in very many ways, not all of which are beholden to any particular, for example, divide between the individual and the social. So the words like perception, social um, experience and so on, these are very, very difficult words. And that particular starting point is not committed to any of those, which I thought was wonderful. Um, I don't know if you know the work of Michel Serre, the French philosopher. Um, he has this wonderful book, Hominescence, which um, is very rich. It's not necessarily easy, but it makes it very clear how the world is inscribed in the body and the body is inscribed in the world. And he traces this as a history since the Neolithic um, in very, very convincing ways. Again, sort of entirely commensurate with the, making the same point as de Beauvoir, but in a great lot of detail. Now, you, you moved ahead then to specifically gendered differences, but as you did so, you, you started making use of things like predictive brains and Priston and, and so on. Um, it's not necessary to elaborate that theme in that particular way. Um, one thing I found it just stabbed me in the eye. You mentioned following a bird. Oh. <laughs> um, three nights ago, I had the beautiful experience of camping out on the Atlantic coast, looking at a sunset. Nobody's a semicircular horizon, dramatic light, absolutely brilliant. And one thing I did was occasionally a bird would appear and I would track that bird and I would track that bird. I had my eagle eyes on. I would track that bird for a long, 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 long time. And I can say with conviction that the, I was not predicting the position of the bird based on the model of the world. The bird was informing me where to go. There was a relationship between me and the bird and it was a mutual relationship and the bird was in charge. And had I take, taken over, saccaded, I would have lost the bird. The bird was in charge. Now, that's a really interesting case in point because cognitivists who like mechanisms, including predictive processing approaches, um, would say that there's there were at least two different mechanisms involved here. One is the vestibular ocular reflex that allowed me to track the bird as I moved. And the other is the pursuit tracking, which allows the, me to follow smoothly without jumps in my eyes. And for that, something needs to be in the world. Now, both of those were in play. And from a processing point of view, 
there's two mechanisms or two entirely different things going on. From a relational point of view, there's me and the bird locked together. I cannot resolve that into any story about perception. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was just the no, track no. The bird thing really got me because that was such a profound <laughs> experience. Um, so the, the general theme can be followed in very, very many ways. And the relationship to anything to do with brains or even the individual um, there's many, many divergent points there. So I found a lot, a lot, I love the starting point and I, I can't follow some of the analyses, but that's that's my bias, of course. Well, me and that bird. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much, Fred. And I, I completely agree. So actually, I've chosen this, this path, first of because I've tr I'm trying to see how far we can go with this joint account uh, of predictive processing or like a predictive version of sensory motor and activism, right? How, which tools can predictive processing provide uh, to sensory motor and activism to tackle other issues that it has had as a view, but also to see how it fits, how uh, the lar larger the data on an activism, right? How it compares to other views and just give it perhaps a bit more tooth, I don't know. No, it's, it's just, I wanted to see how far we can go with sensory motor and activism, how we can make plausible the idea that perception is social in this way or is situated in this more perhaps robust way, right? Although I completely agree with you, I think there is a further question that needs to be asked about once we, you know, put in place the analysis from this predictive version of sensory motor and activism, uh, and we compared how we how it does with other analyses that are already on the table. So I, I will briefly mention the at least the other three analyses. So one is, for instance, Jacobson, who, which is with the person with whom I was kind of arguing with, or you know, we we are my interlocutor for this uh, paper. So her view is more like closely related to perhaps cognitive penetration, right? So the view that if there is any social influence on perception, it only reaches a certain level, and from that perception uh, cannot be penetrated by, by our concepts, and there you have your social influence. Mm. The other two analyses is one coming from uh, Arango, who very recently wrote a paper on sensory motor and activism and the social aspect of perception, and he turns instead to an analysis, he, he finds a way of enriching sensory motor and activism with Wittgenstein, uh, with, with a view from Wittgenstein. And the other analysis comes from an activism, which is uh, Nick Brancasio's analysis. And her idea is to start off from a notion of agency, right? So once we have these views at the table, we can see how, how we can bring them together, how we can debate. So I was just trying to put it out there. Now, on the other hand, even uh, coming from the free energy approach, there's nothing that mandates that we have, for instance, a notion of a representation at, ta at the table when it comes to the free energy approach. So there is an interpretation of the free energy approach that is very inactivist and ecologically friendly way of, of thinking about it. And in this terms, notions as such as prediction or inference become less plausible and perhaps just a way of interpreting what is happening, right? Of saying, well, maybe the system is inferring, but what is happening is a close feedback loop of interaction between the system and its environment. So in that sense, it depends on how we interpret the free energy approach, but it's far closer in some readings to the uh, ecological inactive frameworks. There, there's an interesting gap here. If de Beauvoir is right, and that my history is incarnated in a body that possesses a relationship with the world prior to myself, it's the same not also true of the environments. This, this environment is yes. invoked as if it was just a bunch of surfaces around. One is, in fact, of course, itself a historical product, right? Absolutely. I completely agree. So this is, this is fantastic because this also means that it is neither, we do not come to a, like a fully socially determined world, right? That is fully determined, right? We come unbuilt 
and it is in the interaction that both the environment and the, the system are being constructed, so to speak, right? So, um, yeah, so those are the ideas. I'm, that, that's a kind of um, analysis of the brain energy approach I would be interested in, because I think it can give a very interesting interpretation of the way a biological system recapitulates, you know, and anticipates its social environment. Thank you. Yellow, uh, yeah, yep. Uh, you can unmute yourself there. So yeah. yeah, good. <laughs> um, th thanks, Kevin. That was uh, uh, very rich, and uh, I think it relates to lots of things I also tried to to to, to work on. And um, um, I, I think what you just said in the in the end was also really kind of the the worries I'm having myself as well. So how. Um, how does the free energy approach relate to to an activism? And if you then enrich free energy, right? Then 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 uh, um, how much do you move towards an activism, and how much do you throw away? So, so I think I think the question, my question, is a little bit about the, the what are the sources of 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 uh, how how we can think about normativity here. So in one story of free energy and and predictive processing. Um, the ultimate normativity for a biological organism is to minimize free energy or to minimize prediction error. And all the rest kind of follows from that. Uh, from a kind of young style way of thinking, you might think, well, there is for a gendered body, there is a normativity in, in, in a way of, of throwing a ball. Um, and also myself, I have a hard time seeing how those two kind of styles of thinking about normativity uh, uh, kind of connect to each other. So I wonder if you could say something about that or how that would work. Thanks so much. Yeah. So I know you ask something that I'm still having a lot of problems figuring out, which is on the one hand, I'm just really interested on in the way predictive processing and the free energy approach fit with uh, an activist, the inactivist framework. and that's just a curiosity I have I'm really interested in, you, of course, work on that. Uh, and more specifically, is of, like the question of normativity. I've been wondering whether, for instance, we can uh, have a wider perspective on viability, right? Such that when it comes to actually minimizing surprise, that means very different, very, very different things for uh, more minimal biological system than it means for a social biological system, right? So I'm wondering if by enriching just the notion of viability, right? So for instance, for a social biological system, viability is not just uh, feeding oneself, right? But for instance, is surviving a certain social situation, a social interaction. And I'm wondering if uh, thinking about that might enrich the view even further. So that's that that's the approach I'm, I would try to develop, but I'm still having a, a bit of trouble putting them together because of, as you said, those are two different notions of normativity, even the, the space of interactions that Jung is opening might be far richer in her analysis, of course, than what can be offered by the free energy approach, for instance. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I thought one, one, one direction, um, um, of course, uh, uncertainty, reduction of uncertainty is kind of the current currency and all the other kind of predictivism approaches. And when you showed the kind of um, example of the toddler crawling over the, uh, 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 over the floor, right? And, and looking for the kind of social referencing, um, I think that could be a very rich avenue to, to to pursue indeed, right? That where, um, right? You can reduce uncertainty by acting on the world, or you can reduce uncertainty by checking with with yeah, more yeah. curious people. And in that <laughs> bias that you get back, probably uh, uh, from from I mean, indeed, for for, for 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 the feedback you get from other people is like no running in the park late at night is 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 dangerous. Well, that that really depends for the kind of body that you are. 
the, the kind of answer that you get to that kind of question really depends on, on what kind of person you are, what kind of body you have. Um, and so there you might, you might indeed kind of get, still have some room for uncertainty minimization as, as a kind of yeah. biological system, but, but, but yeah, get some of that enculturation story in us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, for instance, I don't know, uh, putting the weight on the, perhaps thinking that recession depends on that social reference in, in this case, right, might be one way of incorporating at least that kind of normativity into the framework. Um, uh, but I, I think at the, at the same time, I think that to actually reach the, reach the richness of Young's analysis, Perhaps it's not only about, uh, for instance, precision weighting and how we, we might turn to the carer to see, well, actually that prediction should have a lot more, more weight because we're about to fall. Uh, but maybe like the interesting thing is also the richness of the, of the model or, or the bodies as, as the model, how stable some models are and how unstable other models or how unstable, I mean, how flexible they yeah. might be. So that's another way I thought that could be integrated into, you know. Nice, yeah. Nice. You're muted, Mark. Yeah, sorry. I was asking Mason or uh, inviting Mason to un unmute himself, so. I, I have more to speak, but you haven't said anything yet and I didn't want to interrupt if you had something to say to you, but um, when I talk about sort of, the normative space of social interactions. I'm usually speaking about like linguistic interactions are my sort of prime example here. Um, I say something, I'm initiating a, I mean, this is a Terry Winograd and Fernando Flores' sort of metaphor here of a, I'm initiating a dance. I do something, you do something in response. I do something in response to that. You do something in response to that. If I ask you to do something, there's like four or five reasonable things you would do in response to that. If you say, sure, but can I do it later? There's four or five reasonable, yeah, I really need to do it now. Okay, later is fine. What you do constrains what I do and what I what I expect you to do next is based on the sort of normative frame I have for what I think we're doing. I'm asking you to do something. You're playing that dance with me. Here are four or five things I expect you to do. When you don't do one of those, I think, hang on, maybe you didn't understand me correctly. And that sort of misperception hang on, I didn't expect you to do that. Um, it's either because you're refusing to play the game with me or you misunderstood the game I'm trying to play with you. Um, so these kinds of social enculturated expectations about, I mean, not just the bird as Fred's example, but another person who has expectations of me, when those two social normative frames interact, we get misperceptions and misunderstandings all the time. So particularly the, the way in which a social situation might be read by two different people in very different ways. She thinks we're having a, a fun collegial conversation about a really important philosophical topic. He thinks, I wonder if she's interested in me. And so he's got this extra dimension of sexual interaction going on when she's trying to be professional. Um, she eventually, after he, hang on, he's, that was kind of weird. Oh God, I think we're in one of those interactions. Her sort of, eventual understanding that this is a little more creepy than I wanted and a little less professional than I wanted might, I mean, the, the kind of prediction model you're talking about here seems like it's useful to help us understand that sort of, I thought we were playing this game, but I wouldn't have expected you. Oh God, we're playing that game. Um, the way in which we sort of have a, I, I can't imagine women who've had to be hit on by colleagues way too many times a way more through that social experience, that skill development of being able to read a conversation and find the creepy dimension in it, um, are going to be way better at picking up on those slightly creepy weirdnesses than the, the, the male colleague watching this conversation thinks that was purely, purely professional. I didn't see anything wrong there. Um, that she might be able to perceive things that he's unable to perceive. Um, so it's those, I'm sure there's something in the sort of the kind of predictive model you're talking about here to explain these social expectations or social normative expectations about which that are governed by not just what I think you're going to do next, but what kind of game I think we're playing that helps me predict what I think you're going to do next. Um, sorry, I could rant forever about this, but I mean, it's those kinds of 
examples that seem to me useful for studying these kinds of social normative predictions and their failures and so on, and the skill development that happens within those games. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, so it would be fantastic uh, if, for instance, taking this, this analysis into other domains such as something like microaggressions that depends a lot on, on the one hand, the affective disposition of the agent who's interacting and detects uh, microaggressions, so to speak, uh, but also like the sensitivity you require to perceive and to identify that something would be a, a microaggression. So it would be fantastic uh, to take the approach there and to see how it can enrich those other very helpful notions uh, that have been developed in, in the, the debate. Um, and now, now that you mentioned that, for instance, um, how this space, this this space of possibilities, changes as we interact with others. This reminds me. I quoted this paper by Ramsted and colleagues. This recent paper, um, where they define the generative model of of the approach a bit differently, and they say that this is a space of probability that is enacted as we interact. Right. So this space of probabilities. Right, the possibilities or the possible states through which a system might go change change as the the, the agent is interacting. I think that's also relevant for what you were saying. I would like to take that further. So I, those are the kind of interactions I'm, I'm interested in. Yeah, the microaggressions example in particular seems like a really fruitful one here. Though, I mean, yeah. something that I mean, we talked about the sort of skilled perception but the kind of not quite the opposite of that but i'll go with that um the sort of ignorance or the sort of enculturated ignorance that sort of certain people are protected from having to defend themselves in certain kinds of ways and so don't notice those kinds of things and um, the sort of epistemic limitations or epistemic privilege um that the the, disadva the disadvantaged person who has had to protect themselves notices the microaggression in a way that the sort of white person who's totally oblivious just doesn't even see anything there. Um, so if you're looking for something to, I mean, I'm always trying to figure out how can we study this? I mean, I'm a philosopher. I didn't do the empirical stuff too much, but um, for people who are interested in like studying, how can we determine that there is indeed a sort of gendered perception difference here. Um, the, I'm certainly not wanting to privilege gender here, the sort of racialized perception here um, seems to be entirely parallel. You have a lifetime of developing perceptual skills, particularly in aspects where there might be a sort of self-defense need to be able to pick up on those skills, to be able to tell who's going to treat you with respect and who's, yeah, maybe stay away from that guy. Um, perceiving microaggressions in a video scenario or something like that um, starts to look like it could be very easily sort of studyable um, to, to look at who can pick up on the microaggressions that some people are seeing there. Hmm. It seems empirically fruitful in a way that I'm still struggling to figure out how to do though. Yeah, I think I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I completely agree. I think other, other social identities probably are reflected in a similar way. And then other very interesting questions about how different um, levels of normativity play together, um, right? So for instance, yes, of course, for disabilities, a gender identity, race, these are all aspects that can come in in a very interesting way on the way, on what we perceive and on, on the way we perceive the world. And yeah, I'm also very interested in <laughs> Studying this empirically further and see what, but I'm also a philosopher. <laughs> yeah, but no, I completely agree with you. There's a paper from 2016. I just Sorry, quickly... Mason, I, um, uh, I, we're, we're just running close to the end of time. So if, if this oh, is yeah, a very quick true. one, uh, um... I was just going to say there's a paper on racialized affordances. Um, Peter Pierre Salter and G. Adams 2016 Frontiers paper. Um, that's pretty much about this kind of thing and sort of culturally constituted beliefs in, in sort of uh, racialized affordances, the intentionality of everyday words and how the materially constructed spaces and products contain this sort of history of 
culturally enculturated beliefs. So certain neighborhoods look a particular way, certain academic situations look a particular way. Oh, send your copy. Thank you. Thank you. Always nice to, putting, to sign off a, um, uh, a talk that was itself a rich resource with uh, uh, pointers towards other potentially rich resources. So um, I just put a, I just put a link to it in the chat. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, so as we're, we're um, coming close to the end of time, uh, I will just take the opportunity again to say thank you very much Shumina, for your talk. Um, and um, I sort of really appreciate you coming on, particularly I know you've had a, uh, it's been a busy few weeks for you, so um, fitting us in on, on, at this time, uh, I, I'm particularly appreciated. And uh, then hopefully we will be, we'll be back next month with another ENSO seminar. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Good look and tattoo. Don't miss Immanuel Kant's death mask. They have one of only two death masks of Immanuel Kant there in, the, in, in one of the museums. Oh, I had no idea. <laughs> wow. I will. I'm writing it down too. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I ask you one question quickly? You named three different approaches, Jacobson's, the inactive Bercuccio, and another one that's vaguely mentioned Wittgenstein, and I didn't catch the author's name. Oh, the second he, approach. his name is Arango. And, Arango? Um, yeah, I can, let me, I can put the reference here. Uh, Sorry, I'm doing this manually. Um, so that, that's the adaptive like, behavior. Yeah, behavior, that's isn't? right. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry, having grown up on Wittgenstein and then come into inactivism, I want to see how somebody tries to put those two together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Here it is. No, it's a very nice paper. Okay, so there's, there are a couple of, um, I, what I'll do is I'm just, um, there's a couple of links that have shown up in the, um, the, the Zoom chat here. So for our, um, for our YouTube viewers, I'm just going to post them into the, the comment and chat section there. Um, and then we will uh, we'll sign off. So I'll just do that. It's a, a, a novel, um, a novel task to finish off. Um, so <laughs> once again, um, thanks to everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in a month's time for the October Ensel Seminar. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Bye, everybody. Bye. This is well worth getting up early, six o'clock in the morning for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>